This is session six of the Foundations of Finance module. And in this session, I'd like to bring together two concepts we've already talked about, cash flows and discount rates into a single number, the time value of money. You've all heard the saying, right? At the start of every finance class, you're told a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now, or depending where else you're in the world, a peso today, a rupee today. And the question is why? And there are three reasons why a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year, 10 years, 20 years from now. The first is human beings, for whatever reason, prefer present consumption to future consumption. So to get you to give up present consumption for future consumption, assuming you're lending stuff out, I have to offer you some compensation. That's called a real interest rate, but that's just a fancy way of saying, you know, you've got to give people something to give up present consumption. The second is inflation, which is a dollar today might buy a lot more than a dollar a year from now, and that difference is going to widen depending on the inflation rate. So higher inflation becomes, the, the more the difference will be between getting a dollar today and a dollar a year from now. And the third is uncertainty. The dollar today I can collect from your hand, but a dollar a year from now I'm dependent on you showing up and giving me the dollar. And the more uncertain I feel about that, the less value I would attach to the dollar. So the preference for current consumption, inflation, and uncertainty. And as a preference increases, the time value of money will go up. As expected inflation increases, the time value effect is going to be greater. And the greater the uncertainty, the greater the, the time value effect on money. So let's bring this together into a very simple process. The, the mechanics of time value of money are built around discounting or compounding. Discounting reflects the fact that you're bringing future cash flows back to today. And compounding reflects the fact that you're taking today's cash flows into the future. And the discount rate becomes the mechanism I use to bring in all three factors we talked about. So holding all its constant, the greater the preference for current consumption, the higher the discount rate is going to be. The greater the inflation rate, the higher the discount rate. And the greater the uncertainty, the higher the discount rate. Now that said, you can already see why currencies matter when you talk about cash flows. The value of a dollar today relative to a dollar a year from now will reflect the inflation rate in the dollar. But the value of an Argentine peso today and a peso a year from now will reflect the inflation rate in the peso. Currencies matter when it comes to discount rates because depending on the inflation rate in that currency, your discount rate will be higher or lower. And this is something we're going to come back and deal with more tangibly later in both the corporate finance and the valuation classes. The discount rate is also an opportunity cost. An opportunity cost in what sense? When you use a discount rate to discount a cash flow, you're also telling me indirectly or directly that you can make that rate of return on an investment of equivalent risk out there in the marketplace. So when you go looking for discount rates, it's not about what you would like to make on an investment that drives it. It's what you can make on the next best investment of equivalent risk. So discounting brings future cash flows back to today. Compounding converts today's cash flows into future cash flows. So let's talk about some very simple present value principles and obvious ones. The first is, if you gave me an investment with cash flows every year for the next 15 years, I can't add up those cash flows and give you any kind of answer because cash flows at different points in time are different types of cash flows. So cash flows have to be brought back to the same point in time. That can be either today or five years from now. But as long as you bring the cash flow to the same point in time, you can aggregate them, you can subtract them, you can, you can net them up. The second is a good investment rule, whether it's in corporate finance as a capital budgeting rule or in valuation as an investment rule, should be based not only on how much you will get in cash flows from the investment, but when you get those cash flows. That's a discounting, a time value story. So let's talk about the mechanics of converting future cash flows into today. One of the, uh, one of the contraptions that is useful in making this adjustment is what I call a timeline. Sounds fancy, but in a timeline, here's what you do. You draw time as a line. That's why it's called a timeline. Then you show me what you will get as cash flows at each point in time. So here, for instance, is a timeline of cash flows of $100 in cash flows each year at the end of each year for the next four years. You're already going to see that when we talk about cash flows during a year, I need to specify where in the year you get those cash flows. Is it the start of the year, the middle of the year, the end of the year, or all through the year? In this case, these are $100 in cash flows each year at the end of the next four years. 
That's called an annuity. And that will let me then use the mechanism I have for converting annuities into present value. So with that set up, let's talk about the five types of cash flows that you might have to deal with. You know, in fact, every cash flow in finance, I'm going to argue some combination of these five types of cash flows. The first is a simple cash flow. What's a simple cash flow? I offer to pay you $10 million 10 years from now. That's a single cash flow in the future, simple cash flow. Then we're going to talk about annuities. Annuities are constant cash flows that occur at regular intervals. $100 a year every year for the next five years is an annuity. $60 a month every month for the next 24 months is an annuity. The third is a growing annuity. That's a little more daunting, but here's what a growing annuity will look like. $100 growing at 5% a year every year for the next 25 years. So next year I get 105, the year after I get 111, and a 5% growth rate every year for the next 25 years. That's called a growing annuity. And then you get to two measures of cash flows that are truly mind-blowing. The first is a perpetuity, a cash flow, a constant cash flow at regular intervals for the rest of eternity, forever. That's a perpetuity, $100 every year forever. The second is a growing perpetuity, $100 growing at 2% a year every year forever is a growing perpetuity. I'm going to talk about present value equations that work with each of these cash flows. And as I talk about them, you're probably going to wonder why I'm wasting my time because you have a present value function in your calculator. And it's true. Many people no longer use these equations to compute present values because it's already in the calculator. But I would suggest that you try these equations at least once or twice to see what's behind that PV button on your calculator. So let's start with a simple cash flow. You tell me you're going to pay, pay me 10 million 10 years from now. And you ask me, how much is it worth today? Here's what I need to do. I'll take the 10 million and I'll discount it back to today at whatever your rate of return is, whatever discount rate you have. So let's assume that your discount rate is 8%. And that includes your payment for present for giving up current consumption, your dealing with inflation and risk. They're all in there. I will take the 10 million and I will divide by 1.08. That's the 8% convert into a, into, a, into a 1 plus R raised to the power 10. What I get as a present value will be well below 10 million. If I want to take 10 million today and move it into the future, I will do the reverse. I will take the 10 million and multiply by 1.08 raised to the power 10. As simple as that. Let's move on to something about cash flows that we talk about all the time, but we really don't grasp. We talk about the power of compounding and discounting, but until you actually see the numbers, I'm going to argue that you really will not capture that power. Let me give you an example. You have $100 million in revenues right now. Let's assume you project out a growth rate of 50% of that $100 million. That's going to be, that'll mean that your revenues will go from $100 to $150 million. Eminently doable, right? Then you continue to use 50% the year after. Now your revenues have to go from 150 million to 225 million, a 75 million dollar increase. If you keep the revenues at 50%, you're going to see the co compounding effect very quickly start to make your number a really big number. The reason I bring this up is when we get to valuation and you use spreadsheets to value companies, you are often going to use growth rates in percent. And if you're not careful, your revenues, your earnings, or whatever number you grow at that rate can very quickly become an explosive number. We'll come back and deal with it, but be aware that compounding is a very real factor. Conversely, when you're projecting a value 10 years out, which is often what you do in valuation when you estimate the value of a company 10 years out and you bring it back to today, don't be surprised to see a big loss in value. A $100 billion terminal value at the end of year 10 today might be worth only $35 billion. So sometimes working with the numbers will get a bit, give you a better sense of the effect of compounding and discounting. Here's the other feature about discount rates that we sometimes miss. Often for ease of use, we act like cash flows come in at the end of every year. The reason I say for ease of use, is you're in a business, you don't sell all your stuff on December 31st of every year. You sell it through the course of the year. So we, for ease of use, we act like cash flows happen once a year and the discount rate is an annual rate. But to the extent that those cash flows might be monthly cash flows, so instead of having $120 million at the end of the year, let's say you made $10 million every year for the next 10 years, you are in effect going to see, the free, see how much compounding matters if you do it more frequently. I'll give you a very simple example to show you how the compounding effect can change the observed interest rate on a loan or an investment. Let's assume you have a 10% annual interest rate and you compound only once at the end of every year. 
you earn a 10% rate of return. If you compound twice a year, semi-annually, and let's say I just divide the 10% and give you a 5% interest rate in the first six months and a 5% in the second six months, I will actually make 10.125%. You're saying, why? Because the money I make in the first six months will now earn money in the second six months, the power of compounding. If I compound every month, in other words, I take the 10% and divide by 12, and I give you that monthly rate every month for the next 12 months, the 10% becomes 10.47%. In fact, at the limit, if I compound continuously, and this is one of those those, cell, uh, those buttons in your calculator you might never use. It's called the exponential button. You will actually get the limiting case, which is the 10.5171% interest rate if you compound continuously. So the frequency of compounding matters, and that is something to think about, is when you use annual cash flows, you are in fact making this assumption that cash flows happen only once a year, and the rate you're using is an annual interest rate. Let's move on to annuities. An annuity, as I described, it is a constant cash flow that occurs at regular intervals. So if A is the annuity of an annuity which is fixed at A, and every year for the next four years you get A, you got an annuity. The present value of an annuity can be computed using an equation. As I said, most people don't use these equations anymore because they use the payment button in the calculator, but this is what's going on behind the payment button. For a cash flow, for an annuity that happens at the end of every year, notice why that matters, because it affects your present value. The present value is the annuity, the 10 million, the 100 million that you get, times one minus one plus r raised to the power n. So notice all the things that come in, reflect your discard rate. Okay? It looks complex, but you, you can program this in. You can do the, or if you have a scientific calculator to do it on your own. I'll be quite honest. I actually still use these present value functions rather than the payment button on your calculator. That might just reflect my age. I don't trust my calculator to give me the right answer. So if you told me that your cash flow, your annuity is $1,000 a year every year for the next five years, here's the present value. The 1,000 is the annuity. The 10% is the discount rate. Notice it shows up as 0.10. What I get as a present value is 3,791 million. You're saying, how do I know that's the right number? Try this out. Take each cash flow, 1,000 in year 1,000, discount each one separately, add them all up. You should get exactly the same answer. Present values are additive. You can always check your answer. So that's an annuity. Let's talk about growing annuities. A growing annuity, as I said, is, a, is an annuity grows at a constant rate for a particular period, 10 years, 20 years, 25 years. Again, to compute the present value of a growing annuity, you can do it the long way. You can take each of these cash flows and discount it back to today. But let's say you're in a hurry. You want to do it in one step. The present value of a growing annuity can be written just like the present value of an annuity as an equation. And notice the new variable that's popped up in the equation. The growth rate is now part of the game. Your first cash flow, next year's cash flow, will reflect the growth over the first year. So that's A times 1 plus G. And inside the brackets, you see both the growth rate and the discount rate. When you have a growing annuity, the growth rate can actually be higher than the discount rate, and you're still going to be okay. So how can I be okay? G is greater than R. The denominator is going to be negative. When G is greater than R, your numerator will also be negative. This equation will work for any growth rate as long as it's a finite growth rate. So if you have a cash flow growing at 25% a year for the next five years and your discount rate is 10%, try it out. Again, check your answer by discounting each cash flow separately back. The only the only scenario where it will not work is G is equal to R. So what, what do I do then? Remember, if G is equal to R, they cancel out. So if you have $100 growing at 10% a year for the next five years and your discount rate is 10%, the present value is going to be 5 times 100, 500. You don't even need to go through this calculation. Now let's talk about perpetuities. As I said, it's mind-boggling because none of us is going to be around forever. But if you have a cash flow that is fixed and it's going to be there forever, $100 each year forever, the present value of a perpetuity is that $100 divided by the discount rate. So if your discount rate is 8%, 100 divided by 0.08 gives me $1,250. That's the present value of a perpetuity. You see, what's the intuition? If you take that 1250 and put it in a bank, and the bank paid you 8% every year, think of what you're going to get for the rest of eternity. 8% of 1250 is 100. There you go. You can check your answer again. And finally, if you think about mind-boggling, here's an even more mind-boggling concept. A cash flow growing at a constant rate forever. 
$100 growing at 2% a year forever. Here, the present value of growing perpetuity is the expected cash flow one year out. You always have to do that in, in present values. So 100 will become 102 divided by the difference between the discount rate and the growth rate, R minus G. This is one of the most used and misused equations in corporate finance and valuation. You're going to see, the, see me use this later in my valuation class to get terminal value or in my corporate finance class to get the end value for a project. And I'm going to introduce some rules that go with this equation that will keep it from, from running away from you because it can very easily get out of control. But in summary, those are the only five types of cash flows you will ever run into. And knowing the mechanics of computing the present value of the cash flows will stand you in good stead.